most in the West will probably recognize the name Takashi Miike from Audition, his 1999 adaptation of Ryu Murakami's novel of the same name, or from 2001's Visitor Q, the bizarre saga of one family's self-destruction that combines insidious prostitution, necrophilia, and an extremely low budget, both of which we've covered here on Cinemoney Pwn in the past. More likely, however, is that most of you know Miike from today's offering, Ichi the Killer, a film released a mere nine months after the aforementioned Visitor Q. For the uninitiated, Takashi Miike is one of those directors. Notorious for almost never turning down a project due to his sense of adventure, Miike is part of that extremely prolific breed where you go to see their most recent movie only to come out of the theater and see that the same theater is now playing three more of his new films that opened during the two hours you were inside. He's amassed a filmography that officially passed 100 directorial credits in about 25 years. With so many films under his belt, one might wonder, what sets something like Ichi the Killer apart from all the others, making Ichi one of his most standout projects? remembered far and wide after nearly 20 years. How do we put this? Ichi the Killer is essentially what you get when you cross a Yakuza film with an exploitation film, throw in a heavy dose of BDSM, and smother the whole thing in a fairly thick coat of blood. It doesn't pull any punches, but Ichi is something rare. It crosses over from simply being an overly violent flick and into more romantic territory. But before we get into Ichi, let's talk about the director a bit. Takashi Miike began his career at the Yokohama Academy of Visual Arts, where he became assistant director to the school's founder and Japanese New Wave director Shohei Imamura. After a decade as Imamura's AD, Miike spent the next five years directing straight-to-video and TV movies, several of which we've covered in the past. His big break came in 1995, with the theatrical release of Shinjuku Triad Society, an ultra-violent Yakuza flick that spawned two sequels and laid the groundwork for his idiosyncratic theatrical filmmaking. At the end of the decade, the international success of the aforementioned Audition alongside Dead or Alive and Ichi brought his name more readily to the attention of a Western audience. Ever since, Miike has had a fairly consistent run of popularity outside of his home country, even garnering a guest appearance in his 2007 film, Sukiyaki Western Django, from none other than Quentin Tarantino, a self-admitted fan of Miike's work. In an interview with FirstShowing.net, Miike said of his prolific nature, quote, I think it was much harder and had less of my own time when I was an AD, because I was working harder to try to get directors to okay things and give me an okay on what we were trying to do. Now, every time we're shooting, when we're eating lunch, I think if we can take 15 minutes off our lunchtime, we could probably make another movie while we're here as well." End quote. Since the beginning of his meteoric rise to success in cult and underground venues, Miike says that he's talked with multiple companies about directing in Hollywood for a mainstream American audience. But that amount of energy and time involved on this side of the Pacific is tenfold that in Japan. Hollywood, according to Miike, is more corporate, with too many lawyers involved, and has a tense atmosphere compared with Japan. So, with Miike directing films for a predominantly Japanese audience, his works always tend to disregard what will make them popular internationally, meaning their success outside his home country is usually more organic than by design. Ichi is no exception, being a Yakuza film adapted from a manga and set in the heart of the Tokyo Underground. To be fair though, Ichi was partially produced by Omega Project, a company we've discussed previously, who worked on other films like Suicide Club, Audition, the original Ring film, and several others. Omega was set up specifically to help bridge the Pacific Divide in terms of Japanese and American cinema. Rather than having projects arrive in Japan immediately, then eventually in America, films could release simultaneously in both countries. Think of it as the concurrent streaming model of anime now popular, just 15 years early. It's not known whether this had any impact on Miike's vision for Ichi, but given how much of a loose canon he is, it's… unlikely, to say the least. The author of the manga, Hideo Yamamoto, was originally meant to pen the entire screenplay in manga form, but he dropped out, claiming a fit of writer's block. The duty then fell to Sakichi Sato, 
with Ichi being only his second screenplay. All was not well with Sato's screenplay once Miike put it to screen, however, by which we mean that the film experienced a bit of difficulty in terms of censorship. The British censors allowed Ichi to be released in the country due to the ridiculous nature of the violence throughout the film, though they did require that three minutes of violence against women be cut. And when the film premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival on September 14th, 2001, attendees were given complimentary barf bags meant to play off the hype of the violent content. Given how popular it was in the early 2000s age of the DVD to release multiple versions of a film to the market, when Ichi made it to America, it was released in two versions, an unrated version and an R-rated version, that cuts out 11 minutes of footage. Similar to Audition, Ichi has remained a contentious topic all these years later, with some people still claiming it as one of the most violent projects they've ever seen, or that the shocking nature of Ichi hasn't lost its edge. On the other hand, there's an argument to be made that Ichi might have been softened over the years, thanks to more extreme films being made even by Miike himself, or because repeat viewings of Ichi can allow us to recontextualize what the film is about, what may have influenced the project, and what it meant for both Miike and Japanese film at large. With that being said, let's discuss Ichi the Killer so we might better understand these potentials. Ichi the Killer concerns two main hot boys here. Ichi, a brainwashed, sadistic young man who has been effectively programmed to be a killer attack dog, and Kakihara, a Yakuza enforcer on the hunt for his gang boss who Ichi murdered. Problem here is, a couple of cleaners did such a good job mopping up all the blood from Kakihara's boss's murder scene that no one initially realizes he's dead. They think that the boss has been kidnapped, and Kakihara has such a strong bond with this old man that he desperately needs to find the boss. You see, Kakihara has something of a sadomasochistic relationship with his superior. He gets off to harming anyone else with free will, whether they be rival gang members, traitors to his own gang, or just randos. At the same time, he gets off at being beaten by his own boss, commenting that he can't find that type of loving harm anywhere else. This sets Kakihara and Ichi up to be diametric opposites, who both play off one another and cancel each other out. Ichi can't help but harm others, yet he feels remorse for what he does. Kakihara, meanwhile, is slowly coming to the realization that his boss is dead, and is in turn seeking for someone to replace the boss as his new dominant. The film's plot is complicated by several secondary characters who play vital roles in getting Kakihara and Ichi to the point where they encounter one another. There's Gigi, the crafty guy behind Ichi's brainwashing played by Shinya Tsukamoto, director of Tetsuo the Iron Man, among other modern classics. Gigi acts as an informer for Kakihara's gang, subtly pulling the strings in the background of the narrative and driving the main plot without ever really taking credit for his actions. Gigi is an interesting enigma given how we never truly learn his intentions or motivations, allowing us to draw our own conclusions on what he's trying to accomplish here. We also see Kaneko, a disgraced ex-cop who has been reduced to working with Kakihara's group, the Anjo clan. Then there's Jiro and Saburo, a pair of twin detectives who do freelance torture for Kakihara, and who seem to genuinely hate one another. There's Miu Miu and Longi, a prostitute and a subordinate of Gigi who get roped into the whole thing by virtue of these connections. There's also Karen, a strong-willed woman who, similar to Gigi, seems to be somewhat of a wild card who flirts with Kakihara and tries to delve into Ichi's psyche by exploiting his programmed memories. Ichi is something of a messy film when described this way, but there's a reason for that. Essentially, it's meant to be a convoluted plot. We know from the get-go that the Anjo boss isn't dead, but Kakihara doesn't know this. He becomes the de facto head of the gang, at which point Gigi convinces the whole group that boss Anjo indeed fled with a boatload of the gang's cash. We're told directly that this isn't true, but the subsequent snaking narrative is a journey for us as much as it is for Kakihara and company. We effectively start off from different points, but are forced slowly to reach the same endpoint as Kakihara, though even that ends up a bit ambiguous. The way we see it, Ichi is an extremely unconventional love film wrapped in a Yakuza movie. It has all the trappings of a Miike film, and underneath its violent, darkly comic veneer, there's a very human, if not monstrous, heart beating. For one, Miike masterfully crafts characters that are destitute, 
Kakihara could be argued to be a sociopath, but there is an inherent humanism in his quest for the boss that we think makes him too empathetic to be sociopathic. One could say then that he is motivated from selfishness rather than love. Recall when we see Kakihara turn down Karen in the film's second act. She wants to conquer him sexually, yet he says she doesn't have what he needs in terms of a BDSM relationship. It's in scenes like this, which at first blush seem so comical, that we find sincerity in Kakihara, who earnestly doesn't want to be beaten by someone of lesser caliber than Boss Anjo. Kakihara is an anti-hero, maintaining a moral code all his own, even if it is never explicitly stated to the audience. And it's this resolute drive that makes him a relatable character, no matter how detestable his actions may be. He also presents an introduction for the unfamiliar world of BDSM, even if it's not necessarily the most enlightened of approaches. Kakihara walks the audience through the emotional side of kink, displaying his dependence on physical harm through his quest for the missing Anjo boss, and ultimately his perceived necessity for suicide in the absence of that pain and pleasure. The film itself is rife with this type of dependence and loss, given the presence of junkies in need of a fix, Ichi's need for prostitution and sex, not to mention the loss present in the absent mother and wife of Kanako and son, Ichi's own deceased parents, and Kakihara's missing father figure. I saw this film many times as a teenager, and looking back, I had nearly forgotten about the title character himself. Most of my memories were of Kakihara, both how relatable and how detestable he is. Kakihara is someone that we can love and love to hate. He's someone we can project ourselves onto, unlike the true sociopath of the film. Ichi is in a sense a comic foil for Kakihara. He's a teenage boy who has been brainwashed into becoming a killing machine, rather than a suave adult who kills for pleasure. It's important to note that Ichi the Killer is adapted from a manga that ran between 1998 and 2001, penned and illustrated by Hideo Yamamoto, a manga artist known for his grotesque imagery. Another example of this grotesque imagery is presented in perhaps his most well-known work, Homunculus a series which focuses on the practice of trepanation, or the drilling of holes into one's skull in order to unlock extrasensory abilities. In the film adaptation of Ichi, Miike spends a greater amount of time with Kakihara, and Ichi is, in an ironic twist, more or less used from a narrative standpoint in the way that he is used by Gigi. He's not very relatable, and whenever he approaches a state even slightly resembling sympathetic, we're immediately reminded of how terrible he actually is. Ichi the Killer was written and filmed at a time when youth violence was exceptionally high in Japan, having been on the rise for the better part of the 90s. In 2002, psychologist Akio Mori described what he dubbed the Game Brain Theory, which claimed that prolonged exposure to video games can lead to increased emotional sensitivity, thus allowing gamers to become more violent. The theory was largely dismissed at the time, as it is today as pseudoscience, but we think it raises a point about Ichi. He's a hyperbolic representation of how the elder generation at the start of the 2000s viewed young people. Erratic, violent, not entirely cognizant of the harm they caused. Consider Ichi's two pastimes, when he's not murdering people at Gigi's behest. He is either having sex with a disfigured prostitute or playing violent video games alone in his room. He is cut off from reality. And when presented with it, he has no response other than to lash out when directly provoked. And it's in some of these provocations that some people have taken issue with Ichi as a film. A popular question about Miike, particularly in his films involving women, is whether he is a feminist or a misogynist. The camp arguing the former states that Miike's female characters are driven by a desire to wrest power from the men who hold sway over them. Like with Asami in Audition while the latter cites his character's acts of violence against women, particularly those in Ichi, as a celebration of male empowerment fantasies. It's a similar situation to how David Lynch has been received for much of his career, due to his inclusion of rape and brutality against women in his films, especially in early works like Blue Velvet. Again, one side says he is a feminist, while the other claims he is a misogynist. In the case of Ichi as a film and Miike's body of work in a broader sense, it's easy to see points for both sides, though as we've delved deeper into Miike's filmography, we'd like to believe that Miike doesn't really have an interest in feminism nor misogyny. Instead, it seems more like Miike is primarily interested in getting a rise out of his audience. Nothing more, nothing less. 
This means that films like Ichi and Audition are more of a litmus test for the audience, rather than Miike's own intentions. Still, it's a fun exercise to consider Ichi the Killer in both senses. After all, as one of Miike's top films alongside Audition, there's a certain value of taking stock of how viewers might consider the meaning behind Ichi, even if it has no bearing on the intent. But then again, maybe that's one topic that's off-limits for film criticism in the modern day. Impressive. No matter how deep the theme of your artwork is, Westerners will reduce it to garbage identity politics or feminism. Fuck this. Wow. While the film contains three female characters who serve little purpose other than to be beaten and eventually killed to advance the plot, the same can be said of the male minor characters. Ichi himself is mentally controlled by Gigi through two male power fantasies, wanting to simultaneously stop a case of sexual abuse from occurring and being the one to commit the act. The former is derived from a muddled, manufactured memory on behalf of Gigi, while the latter is an expression of Ichi's repressed sexuality as an adult. However, two of the three female characters among the body count of the film actually have a surprising amount of agency on second glance. Kirin, in particular, is notably the only character in the film to give Kakihara lip and to not receive comeuppance as a result, when she diverts his questions as to boss Anja's location early on. The woman who Ichi attempts to save only to end up murdering doesn't think twice about resisting his advances when confronted with near certain death. It's important to consider the way in which Miike's films become violent when asking whether Ichi is a misogynist fantasy or not. In an interview with the AV Club, he said, quote, Me personally, I'm not a big fan of violent movies. It's not something I like to watch. And it's not my aim or goal to make a violent movie. My characters are very important. So when I'm trying to depict a certain character in my movie, if my character is violent, it will be expressed that way in the film. You cannot really deny what a character is about. The more I try to make the character come to life in the movie and depict what he's really about deep inside, that's when the movie tends to become violent. To repeat, my movies end up becoming violent, but I don't start with the intent of making violent movies." End quote. In short, in keeping with what we've found to be true of Takashi Miike's other films, it seems that he simply makes character studies which sometimes facilitate violence. We say sometimes because a lot of Miike's less popular films are less violent and perhaps more nuanced. This is likely the exact reason they're Miike's lesser-known projects. They're simply not as eye-catching. It's this method of writing that explains how the same man who directed Ichi could direct something like Happiness of the Katakuris, an absurdist family-centered musical featuring claymation and zombies. Like Happiness, we've covered a wealth of Miike's films here on Cinema Nippon, so if you're a fan of Ichi or Audition, but you haven't delved deeper into his filmography, be sure to check some of these videos out. On the other hand, if you haven't seen Ichi yet, and you're looking for a fun, raunchy time with a film that should probably take itself more seriously than it does, be sure to check this one out. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you might have to look away at points, if only for the implication rather than the ridiculous visuals. But whether you're delighted or disgusted, Ichi is certainly worth the ride. And if one gore fest isn't enough, a direct-to-DVD prequel about Ichi's high school years Ichi Ichi, or One Ichi, was released in 2003, directed by Masato Tano, and with Nao Omori reprising his role as Ichi. Maybe one day we'll take a look at that one, but for the time being, Ichi the Killer has a wealth of subtext, meaning, and influence that's still being felt today, and that is more than enough for us.